So we've also been joined by um, someone new. Um, and now we're going to sort of move into a, a dovetail. And when we were with um, Michel in South Africa, in Stellenbosch, where we had an extraordinary week meeting essentially all the people who had the relationships that had sort of come to be through my research, because I'd been invited to do my field research at the Sustainability Institute, and that led to relationship with the CST, Complex Systems in Transition, with RICA. Um, but really what kind of emerged was um, a quite <coughs> extraordinary, um, it was, there was definitely no plan. It emerged, the whole week just emerged. We had, maybe, we had two particular anchors of seminars and forums, mm -hmm. but essentially everything kind of morphed and merged and it was really quite a lot of it was based around being in beautiful places, eating really good food that was from the land and drinking wine that was organic and biodynamic. But that was just, there was, not, there was nothing special about that, that was just what occurred because we were in that kind of place. And it was very multicultural, very multi-ethnic. And I think that when we had one of our interactions, which was with Jess Shoshan from the Sustainability Institute, the director, and with Theo Oldjohn, who is the director of the Agroecology Academy there, one of the experiences and encounters that we had, um, Theo, we then had something the next day, and Theo and most of the same people were at it, but a lot of new people weren't at it, and Theo had this beautiful way of saying, shall we do something that brings what we did yesterday into today? And he did it through an object, mm. didn't he? Yeah. I feel that we don't have objects necessary because the whole room is an object. But we do have three... We have three people, apart from Michelle, who said a little, and uh, Ben, who were yesterday at my performative installation and ritual. And what would be wonderful, before hearing from those who have just encountered it, just to sort of bring yesterday's energy and bring... Um, I think I found some pictures of um, hills. Is that, is that human cherry? Yes. So I found those in the kitchen. So we did a little tribute to, to um, the person, um, Lawrence Hills, who set this place up and um, gave some gratitude and thanks to the place. But it would be lovely just a couple of words from Julia, Charles, and Phil, just to say something of what your experience of the day was yesterday, because of course it wasn't around a seminar or a forum, it was literally about being in the place and being in the garden. So just a couple of little words, and then we'd like to open it up. I'm not sure it can be done in a couple of words, this is my problem. You might have a gesture. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to do a gesture either. But um, I am happy to say a couple of things about yesterday, mm. um, which I think was very much aligned with what Michelle was just saying about cause vision for and she's back she is back yeah it was very much aligned I think with um, cause vision for transdisciplinary approaches in research mm. because what we experienced yesterday was an encounter not with it wasn't a presentation about Mish's work so it wasn't Mish standing up saying so here's my research journey and here's what I've done and this is a, a, these are the measurable outcome and here's the social impact and all of this um, language that wasn't actually particularly present so what we were invited to do was to go and um, get those messages by engaging with material by mm. being together by sharing lunch outside around the fire which um, was just out in the mm. cook's garden I think it was called yep. just here um, so I think what we were being invited to do was to immerse ourselves in the act of being transdisciplinary mm. rather than in a explanation about what that is. So we were not actually theorizing yesterday as much as we were practicing something. Mm. And um, bringing in food uh, ritual and ways of being and ways of moving mm. into the space through not presenting but through being is quite a radical and 
difficult thing to do. So it was very much a um, shared responsibility. Mm. We were all invited to take responsibility for engaging, so you were not just coming to be fed, as it were, even though we were fed both by cakes and other delicious things that were emerging. It was about being fed, fed intellectually as much as it was about engaging different ways of knowing in the moment. So mm. That was sort of what I came out with from yesterday, and it just felt like Michelle has actually done the theory behind what we experienced yesterday in my introduction just now. Um, so that's more than a couple of words, but I love a couple of words, and I always have them. <laughs> <laughs> Charlotte, you've said a lot of it. What was really lovely, and I don't know if you've had time today as well, is to explore the objects and the artifacts and this kind of childlike fun of looking at them, mm. you know, and things you think you might not be meant to be looking at. So, you, you know, and so that actual visceral experience of getting involved in, in it is, is, a, is a great thing we used to do. Yeah, um, I think that it's all been said in a way. Maybe I could just add the, the hailstones in the can canola soup. <laughs> <laughs> Which, the soup wasn't a soup. It, it, even though it's called a soup, it was actually a kind of, what do you call it? Uh, potage. Potage. You know a potage. Um, so yeah, we went out, followed the red thread, uh, which was a literal thread that went out to the garden, the cook's garden, and as we heated up the soup um, on the fire, it started hailing, and we all got wet, and we all had to come back in. Uh, so somehow there was something very sensuous in that experience as well. So it was about this, this notion of ways of knowing that actually include the sensuous um, and the heart, as Michelle very eloquently put it. Um, somehow we were trying to kind of practice that in some way, in amongst this very, also very conceptual and um, conceptual body of work that's in here as well, uh, and finding our own kind of pathway through that um, in, a, in a spontaneous mood of discovery as well, which was nice. So there's all sorts of questions around what is research and what is it to engage in a knowing way with very complex realities that we live in. Um, so yeah, there's something very rich there. Thank you. So just to remind ourselves that this seminar forum encounter was entitled Artful Research Cultures. <laughs> Exploring Artful Research Cultures. And I think um, it is that idea of experimentation and innovation. And it is through um, a relationship with the body um, and remembering that as um, uh, Wendell Berry says, can you read the Wendell Berry up? Yes. Um, what value and respect do we give to our bodies? What uses do we have for them? What relation do we have, if any, between our body and our mind or our body and our soul? And what connection or responsibilities do we maintain between our bodies and the earth? So we had a beautiful um, uh, response from Rika yesterday who joined us by Skype with her red thread, her red scarf. And uh, she spoke about um, a, a way of being with the research, which is how do we come to an accountability and have research which has a reliability and a trustworthiness. And for me, that question has been answered by recognizing that any research, she, thought she, she jokingly said, you jokingly said, Rika, it's a bit, it's a bit rich to talk about uh, research ethics and actually how your work actually creates an ethos of respect and um, integrity and wholesomeness because of that quote that Wendell Berry speaks of, which is, I don't see that my body has any relationship to anything but being on this earth, but there has to be soul, there has to be a connection between the mind and the soul, and the mind and the body, which is why I've called it the artful body-mind, but in order to remember that I have a body-mind and that I am not a split human being, and that I am entwined and entangled in all these life processes, um, we need to recover something, and that's the imagination, and the imaginal, and the working with the matter, and working with the unconscious, 
So essentially, I would be calling my, my research, research with soul in mind. It's the idea of researching and going back again to find something that we've lost. Which is why you will see many, many different ways of knowing and being. And I did have to get very lost for myself as well. Which is why some of the rituals and some of the um, collage material that you see was me seeking to make meaning outside of the maze and the haze of the words which can pollute and um, smother and somehow really trick you. So I felt very um, honoured to be invited by Michelle. He actually invited me. I don't think I'd ever considered doing a PhD. But when he'd seen our work, and when he invited me, and I knew that I had Flora alongside me, and I said for the first response was, I will do this PhD. I would love to. I think it's an incredible honour. It's, an, it's, a, it's actually something that needs to be done. Um, I would invite Flora to be my thinking partner, and that's what has made the richness and the vitality of this emerge because of our different skills, our complementary ways of knowing the world, but also the actual forging of a very new kind of collaboration, which is one that's based on incredible trust, integrity, and, and going to the depths with each other. Mm -hmm. And that we do through engaging with and respecting matter. I don't think we can come to know without having matter between our hands, whether it's working with food, making fermented cabbage, making an artwork. To me, it's all one. Hello, would you like to say anything before we bring the weekend? No, I'm very happy to... And yeah. Paul, you wanted, you had suggested that maybe people share. Rika, can we, um, would you like to hear um, from others how they've experienced this room now, or there would, have you got something that you would like to share around um, Michelle's, the, the collaboration, the art of collaboration between us? What do you think? I think it'd be great to hear Rika. Rika, um, because technology might not. <laughs> uh, Rika, honey, are you happy to, to, to ent enter in now and just share what feels right for you to share? Were you able to hear Michelle's reflections? I didn't hear the full reflections, um, but I followed the rest. Great. Are you, are you happy to, to, to spend a bit of time now sharing a bit about your work and about the, the sort of evolution of our relationship between the CST and CORE through Misha's research and, and a little bit about what, what you're seeking to emerge with us? Would that be? Yeah. Great. Thank, thank you. you. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, thank you for your patience with the Skype. I know that the technology is very intrusive and... Um, direct attention in the wrong way. So thank you for, for that, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say something a little bit about our centre. We are a school research centre um, called the Centre for Complex Systems and Transition. And it's a support in the disciplinary research centre, where we also really try and address sustainability um, problems, challenges from an inter and transdisciplinary perspective. Um, at this stage, uh, we're about four or five senior researchers, we have some postgraduate students, and we have some postdocs. Our funding is mostly soft, soft money, project related. Um, and uh, so we do a lot of grant writing and project writing <laughs> to fund ourselves. Um, I think also that this is the nature of this kind of research. Um, is that when you start doing this transdisciplinary work, it's very rare that you find a spot where you can actually um, embed yourself structurally and institutionally, because I think our institutions are really built in that way. And I think that's what is so amazing about CORE, is that it's set up in a way that overcomes the institutionalism of it. <laughs> so we've, we've tried to find ways in which to sort of engage with this notion of transdisciplinarity. Um, that goes beyond just, um, I would say, normal sort of stakeholder engagements. A lot of our funding comes from development agencies, and we're supposed to influence development agendas through a systems thinking and a resilience thinking lens. So that's why I'm at Stockholm Resilience Centre at the moment. They are one of our core funders in a sense, and we're in partnership with them to think how the the whole framework of resilience, or this notion of resilience, can actually infiltrate um, into policy making domains where you can actually start talking back to funders and policy makers how 
or as a lens perspective, could change the way we think about the development in general and sustainable development more specifically. Um, and through this funding project, the money was mostly focused and benchmarked for um, bringing together different stakeholders to engage in meaning-making processes, uh, dialogue, um, to discover you know, what the needs are, you know, the knowledge gaps are, so that we can speak back to, you know, and, and, and sort of draw from those real-life experiences with um, uh, bottom-up stakeholder processes <laughs> to, to then create new knowledge and influence decision-making through policy. Um, paper writing, the supervising students, those things happen then between 12 and 3 in the morning. <laughs> so, um, so it was a huge challenge for us to, um, especially in the African context, to, to start engaging with stakeholders on the operations on, on different levels. Uh, our funders wanted us to go into the townships and pick the natives and you know get the grassroots uh, <laughs> knowledge so that we can influence the top levels, which is obviously a very naive idea. Um, and based on our understanding of complexity and how complex systems work, we decided that it becomes almost impossible and very imperialist to think that we actually have the agency, the legitimacy to go and speak to people who live in dire situations where they are the bare logistics of everyday activities um, you know, borders on survival every day. Um, and also in South Africa, especially when we work, these communities are overexploited in a way for, for research purposes. So we've, we've sat down and we thought, how can we actually do this? And we came up with this idea that uh, from a kind of a relational approach, by thinking of systems as relations that come about through relations, how would we think about when influence change and how can change happen? So I'm going a little bit, I'm, I'm arriving at the, at the goal through a little bit of what I did to it, so just hang with me. <laughs> And we realized that actually if we do understand that um, communities or realities made up of relations and processes rather than entities that we can move around on a chessboard or little machines that we can just pull leverages on, um, creating spaces where, where people can have different kinds of encounters with each other that could break from the, the um, agencies that are stuck in specific patterns of relations. So we came up with this idea to say, well, the only way that we can actually influence or bring about change is by creating transformative spaces. These are safe spaces where we engage uh, many different people um, and we then have conversations with each other that we would not normally have. And our hope, belief is that through these new conversations, connections that people might have in these spaces, they might reflect differently on who they are, what agencies they have, what power they have in the system, and um, by this re-evaluation, reflection, possibility of new connections could, could happen. And it's through these new connections um, that change could happen. And we have no control over who makes the, those connections, why they make them, and what happens, what the outcomes of those connections are. So it's a very organic understanding of how change could happen. So we, we run a few workshops, um, some scenario building processes, some dialogue, some immersive learning journeys. And often early, the only people that were included in these processes were um, either NGOs, activists, um, members of high-level UN commissions or regional commissions, um, AU, UN, FAO, <laughs> um, high-level you know, important decision makers, and then some heavy hitting scientists. And these were like the, you know, the ingredients that, that was, you know, these were sort of the elements that were put into the pot to have these conversations. And at some stage I realized that through iteration of these processes, that these, um, that the elements that were put into the pot almost also restrict the kind of outcomes, engagements, and emerging processes that can be there. So if you only have those kinds of people in the room, the patterns of the conversations will always follow the same route. And um, I was determined to change that. Uh, this is where my interest in engaging with artists went on. To say, well, if we, if we at least could include some artists that aren't typical change makers or system change 
makers. Um, we could actually break up those structured processes that people enter the room into. Because if you have an important decision maker that sits around the table, that person engages from his or her role in the system, and not as a person. And that's a very different way of engaging. So we needed a way to break down those roles so that people could actually engage as, with people affected in terms of who they are and what, is, you know, what their role is grabbed at them. And through bringing in artists and engaging with artists in these processes, we've realized or we've actually experienced how, how people could actually break away, break free from those roles um, and be challenged by the logic of the artist and the experience of the process which doesn't fit to the wardrobe style or important black desk and dark wooden tables, but actually um, challenges us to engage with, uh, with a different kind of logic, uh, which is uh, undoing the structure. Um, so we experimented with a few uh, ways of engaging. We've uh, engaged, uh, we've, inst we've had a lot of art installations in public spaces, and arranged um, encounters between you know, basically um, to have different kinds of encounters uh, with people. Um, so we've, we've used sort of, uh, well not used, <laughs> we've explored different kinds of possibilities for people to have different encounters in public spaces, with artists installing art in, in the company gardens or on the university plane, and um, also disrupting um, existing art exhibitions in the university museum with, which we used our work, we put them on on display between other very formal series um, exhibitions, disrupted those ways in which people view those those works and then have sort of participatory um, events where we just um, engage with conversations of what, what happens when we see those disruptions. Um, and then we, we, we sort of got a little bit more confident and um, thought about having this and hosted this uh, art prophecy event at the Sustainability Institute, where we, where we sort of had a whole um, event uh, with engaging different artists coming together and sharing their practices with them, um, scientists, activists, and decision makers, um, and actually gave the artists uh, the space to talk and allow us to journey through their process, processes and methods. And that was the day where we, the first time, encountered the work of Mish and Flora and asked them to host uh, an experience, run an experience. Um, my colleagues thought that they were going to cater for lunch for us. <laughs> so so we, we, we had the lunch option. I said, uh, don't worry, we'll have food at the event. Um, <laughs> Uh, but then when they got there, it was this fantastic immersive experience where they had to, it was an extremely hot day, really a truly Anthropocene, a, future, a day in the future of the Anthropocene, it was almost 40 degrees, um, and uh, we, ha we had the, the event next to the compost heap in the garden with no shade, um, and people had to borrow hats and scarves from each other to protect themselves from the sun. Um, and then when we got there, in the preparations, um, it was a totally immersive, emergent event. Um, Mission for uh, arrived with all their equipment, the tools, and ritual uh, materials. And um, they saw, I think, in my face, the, the surprise at you know what we were going to be. And I said, I don't worry what happens. At least, at least if we had a place, things will go uh, fine. They will arrive and they will have a new place. Um, so it was this wonderful emergent moment where we sat at the table with our plates, but food in abundance, beautifully organized and artfully installed, with no equipment or tools to eat with. The people were in the heat, sitting there next to the compost, the, the food was available, no tools, so we had to even reimagine and reorganize you know, how we think about encountering food not just encountering each other. Um, and I think that was really a fantastic moment where we could uh, see the, the power of, um, um, of how engagement and encounter with art allows us to rethink who we are as humans, how we encounter ourselves, nature, food, our values, um, and how it allows us to 
reconfigure the established patterns of thinking, doing, being that are so ingrained in how we come to be as researchers, digital kids in this world. Um, so it's from there that um, through the integrity of that, of that event, the communication, the following up, and the rigor um, in which Mission Flow you know, captured the event and engagements, that um, I think supported the idea that what we call this art science engagement is something that, um, yeah, that we'd like to pursue. And I think initially I felt like an outsider in our research group that uh, I'm the one that does the fluffy artist group. Um, <laughs> um, and always, and what irritates me about that is art, these, in these events, the artist um, is always seen as the attachment or as the, as the, the thing after the event or the, 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 the installation you put where the food will be, will be served, you know, or you know, it goes where it's not the main thing, but it's, it's always sort of attached to some event. We even had the resilience, the huge resilience conference here in Stockholm two years ago, where art formed also a central theme around if we cannot calculate uh, what the future will be, at least we should start imagining or reimagining it, and artists should, should help us reimagine uh, those um, configurations. But even here at the Resilience Center, um, the two installations we worked with was put down in the basement where people would go to the bathroom and wash their hands, or on the fourth floor we had to go and make an effort to go and see the exhibit. Um, so how do we start living in and understanding that, you know, that the engagement group are actually should be central. It should be the fourth should we walk to have that experience, um, to help to help self unlearn the structures that uh, yeah, that um, I would say restrict our abilities to be engaged with new ideas, new methods, um, new people even. Um, and through this journey that I've started following other communities that are also um, engaging with art science approaches or um, <coughs> banging with these two worlds. Um, but two, two or three weeks ago I was invited to the uh, the IFACA meeting, it's the International Federation for Arts and Culture Commission, so it's like the umbrella commission that orchestrates all the formal um, institutions that govern cultural work, so um, in, uh, all the sort of um, ministries of art and culture work uh, came together at this meeting. And what became very clear is that um, through the practices and the experience people have been having um, in these commissions, whether they're commissioned artists or artworks or cultural work, more and more it's become, becoming clear that um, the role of art is not just one to sort of engage with in our leisure time or to engage with when we go to the opera or to the museum um, or to commission a choir <laughs> or dance but it is actually to break down the barriers that are more and more um, uh, characterize in society as we know it. Especially in Europe, especially in America, there's a, lot, a huge polarization happening at the moment between rich and poor, black and white, immigrants, citizens. Um, uh, and, and the spaces and, and our understanding of democracy and our traditional cult, you know, say traditional, I'll say, the way in which we understand um, westernized cultures. Um, is being, is a huge, uh, people are experiencing this um, radical uh, pluralization and radical uh, influence of values and, uh, at the moment as very threatening. And it seems that uh, work, well, the important work that artists and artistic processes have in this space is actually to provide a, a common space where people can um, have these different kinds of encounters. Um, and where this notion of world making can restart anew. Um, we have to rebuild our understanding of what it means to be a community um, uh, and how to reconfigure, reimagine the new values for living together in this world which is marked by radical plurality. Um, just one short um, 
experiment that stood out for me also was uh, the, the commissioner of um, cultural ministry of the city of Minnesota in America, where they embed artists in their municipal structures. Um, she actually managed to get funding from, from some part of the, the budget, <laughs> the formal budget, to employ artists in every one of her municipal um, uh, boards and offices and little categories. And these artists, then their main job is not to produce art, but actually accompany the bureaucrats to allow the bureaucrats to um, see their clients, um, which are the citizens, as real, as real humans and not just as um, numbers on a spreadsheet or a Gantt chart. Um, and they've had wonderful successes with uh, integration, because uh, Minnesota is also uh, a city that's marked by huge influxes of uh, migrants from Somalia, uh, Tanzania, uh, yeah, Somalia and Ethiopia, for example. Um, and the parallel societies that uh, actually develop uh, you know, when there's no real integration happening. So that, that's just my experience. I think more and more I'm becoming more confident <laughs> That, um, uh, that there are more encounters and more engagement to be had between these worlds that we call art and science. Um, and that it's actually the learnings that we can have from each other is that um, is the commitment and the rigor that artists bring to observing differently, uh, presenting differently, feeling differently, um, this body-mind connections that they bring with, that we've learned, that we've lost. Um, and to help us reconnect with ourselves, with nature, um, and with the, the ideas, the values that we bring forth. Um, so it's in this, in, with this sort of growing confidence and I think acknowledgement from a broad range of spaces these days, that we can just um, think that art and the art, artistic processes and artists are those um, people and processes we leave for that little moment in the program where we have five minutes left or where the space that they can occupy, you know, when we don't have real conversations happening in the conference or in our meetings, but actually integrating fully in our processes to be for us to become more human, learn how to integrate and to become more connected. So so that's uh, that's the little journey that I've um, had in the, in the past three or four years in this space and I think working with Mission Flow has just sort of uh, on all levels um, supported those hinges, those visions that I've had. And I hope that we can actually, through this collaboration core and the ways in which you are doing things, strengthen that and um, learn to share with each other, from each other, and to uh, start creating those transformative spaces where we can invite others in to experience how we, how we become. Um, with each other and how we need each other. Um, and it's just the, the end of those words of Donna Haraway that, that say that we become with each other in real or imagined ways um, or we don't become at all. Um, so it's this idea of co constituting each other. Without each other, we don't fully become. So, so let's really learn that and actually actively seek those spaces and funding mechanisms and research and collaborative possibilities to become all of you. Thank you very much for your patience on the technology. Appreciate it.